Coming up next, Sitting at 30 takes you downtown for the weekly luncheon meeting of the City Club of Portland. Live weekly coverage of City Club is made possible in part by TCI and is produced through the facilities of Portland Cable Access. Now we join the City Club for this week's program. Good afternoon. I'm Lloyd Anderson, president of City Club. Welcome to another program. Today we focus on a creative and innovative program designed to serve America's poor, the Clementi Course in Humanities. The founder of that program, Earl Shores, is with us today. This program is co-sponsored by the Oregon Council for the Humanities. New members, Brett Kennedy, Kenny, manager, many, managing attorney, Native American program, Oregon Legal Services. And Stephen Gregory, retired business executive. On Friday, September the 17th, join us for a timely program called Schools In. What's next for Portland Public Schools? Featuring Superintendent of Portland's Public Schools, Ben Canada. That meeting will be at the Hilton Hotel Pavilion Room. Please note the change in location. This is the last call for the Fall Chef Series we still have 10 members only slots available in this fall series featuring Cor Corey Schreiber from uh, Wildwood, Vitali and Kimberly Paley from Paley's Place, uh, and uh, Kenny Giambali Vo from uh, Pazzo Ristorante. If you're a City Club member and wish to participate, call Winnie at the City Club office on Wednesday, September, by Wednesday, September the 15th at noon. Our board host seat, seated at the head table today is Carol Stone, member of the Board of Governors and Executive Director of the Regional Drug Initiative. She'll ask the first question of the speaker. Following Carol's question, we'll open the members uh, program to questions from City Club members in the audience. Please uh, Please limit your questions to 30 seconds or less, if you can. And we'll ask that, that members of, of City Club and members of the Council for the Humanities uh, be the ones that ask the question. Broadcast of City Club program this quarter is made possible in part because of corporate underwriting from CH2M Hill, Weyerhaeuser, Pacific Care of Oregon. We're grateful for their support. Today we'll be talking about empowerment of the poor. One needs to be reminded what Samuel Johnson said, a decent provision for the poor is a true test of civilization. And perhaps the, broad, the, the view needs to be broader gauged than the British aristocrat, the Duke of Argyle, who said, there's two kinds of people in the world those that are nice to their servants and those who are not. <laughs> to many working in poverty programs who wonder why the poor don't get more involved in helping set public policy, the conclusion more often than not is that poverty takes all of their time. Our speaker today, Earl Shores, is one of our more thoughtful commentators on the culture of poverty in the United States. His view is that in our time, poverty prevents people from engaging in civic life, thus removing their grasp 
from their grasp the opportunity to improve their lot, and thus all too often assuring that the poor will continue to be poor from one generation to another. He stressed the need to restore a sense of political identity to the poor. To test his theory that one cause of poverty was the exclusion from the political life of citizenship, he initiated a university level course in humanities for poor young people aged 17 to 35. The Clementi Course in Humanities. That course, now in its fourth year, is being taught in four countries and numerous places in the United States, from Seattle to New York. The possibility of starting such a program here is under discussion with the Oregon Council for the Humanities and others. Mr. Shores comes out of the Hutchins plan at the University of Chicago. He's had articles in magazines including Harper's, The Atlantic Monthly, and The Nation, and has had numerous books pub published including The Oppressed Middle, Scenes from Corporate Life, Power Sits at the Other Table, at Another Table, and New American Blues, A Journey Through Poverty uh, to Democracy. In addition to his many lectures, he's a commentator on Marketplace, a public radio international program. Please welcome Earl Shores. Thank you. Um, I should tell you, just looking at the height of the microphone and, and my height, that um, there are some people who are thinking about making a, a film about the Clemente course. And, uh, and they called me up and they said, we're thinking about making this movie. Who would you like to play you? And I knew immediately what to say. I said that uh, Sean Connery would be just right. <clears throat> and, and they said, how would you feel about Mickey Rooney? So. <laughs> anyway, it's, it's nice to be here. Thank you. The, we're here because of one of the smartest people I've met in a very long time. Uh, and he's the, he's the husband of Natalia, and he's the father of two very wise gentlemen, uh, Sebastian uh, and... Uh, and uh, his brother, whose name is Gabriel, Gabriel, goodness, uh, and, and his name is Christopher Zinn, and uh, I, I must tell you, he understands more about what we're doing than we understand about what we're doing, and he knows a lot more about the humanities than we know about the humanities, and uh, I think Christopher Zinn should take over Reed College and, uh, and help them out with the humanities. And we, we've also had some good luck talking to people from Reed College and marvelous people here in Portland. My wife, Sylvia, who's sitting at the table there, and I are, are just uh, pleased to be here. We think it's a, it's a marvelous place. And uh, I must tell you, uh, I grew up in El Paso, Texas, in the high desert, uh, and Portland is nothing like home. It <laughs> I'll, I'll see if I can uh, tell you as much as possible in the next 25 minutes or so about the Clemente course. Uh, I'll try and give you some idea of where it came from, uh, how we do it, and what we hope you will do here in Portland. The course began uh, out of uh, uh, some conversations. One was uh, with my editor, a fellow named Starling Lawrence. He and I were talking about poverty, and I said to him, I have an idea about poverty. It's an idea that is really more political philosophy than practical. It's that there's a difference between power and force. And, uh, and Starr being the kind of guy he is, he said, well, it just takes one idea to write a book, and you've got an idea, so let's do a book. And then he, he stopped and he said, but when you finish writing a book about poverty, you better have something to say about what to do. And I thought, yeah, everybody's got an answer for poverty. You know, with, uh, Mr. Clinton has an answer for poverty, and, and Mr. Bush has an answer for poverty, and, and the British royalty had answers for poverty, <laughs> as we know. <laughs> anyway, I embarked on the book. I spent ab about four years wandering around the country, and uh, I went north, south, east, west, saw people who were Asian, uh, 
black, brown, white, uh, saw people who were uh, Protestant, Catholic, Jewish, Buddhist, Muslim, uh, and, and so on, and, uh, and, and visited people urban and rural as well. What does one see when you, when you look at the problem of poverty? Well, w one thing we know is that the William Julius Wilsons and, and so on aren't quite right because they said all we needed were jobs and we'd solve the problem of poverty in this country. And we know now that the unemployment rate has fallen to, what is it, 4.2% uh, the last time? And the poverty rate is at 13% uh, or better. So we, we know that it isn't just a function of, of jobs. And we understand now that Mr. Clinton and all our uh, good friends in the Democratic Party, as well as the Republican Party, favor welfare reform. And we know that that's a system for getting people off welfare, but it's not a system for getting people out of poverty. So, so there don't seem to be a lot of good answers. Uh, and one of the things you begin to notice is that the problem itself can, can be seen if you go out into the real world, if you, uh, if you look at what happens. What you see is that poor people live within what I've begun to believe is a surround of poverty. And, and this surround of poverty is, is made up of forces, so that there are forces on all sides. If we, if we numbered them, we would get up to 25 or 30 or more. And if you think about it, the forces are uh, they might start with a terrible landlord, bad housing, a terrible neighborhood, might be alcoholism, drug addiction, might be just not having enough to eat. Racism is one of the forces people have to deal with. Health, uh, bad health, etc. And what you get in this surround of force is a kind of killing system. If you think back on the way that natives in, uh, in the Americas kill people, kill buffalo, they did it by driving their enemies or buffalo into a surround where they became panicked, they destroyed each other, they were helpless, and they were easy to kill. If you think about the German Panzer Division, it worked in the same way. It was a surround and then destruction. What happens to the poor within this surround is that there's no time to think, there's only time to react, there's no way to be a public person, you must live uh, completely private life, and you cannot be a citizen. You become de facto not a member of the society. De jure, you may be a citizen, but de facto you're not. You don't participate, you don't vote, you have no sense of legitimate power in the society that we believe in. So you ask yourself, if this is the problem of being poor, how do people get out of this? How do people begin to be citizens? Isn't that one of the ways to get out of poverty? You say to yourself, well, there, there are ways. They have to become political. Martin Luther King knew how to make people political. He was certainly one of the great thinkers, great people of this century. There was a, a man in Texas whose name was Willie Velasquez, who many people don't know. Willie died young. He used to take kids in the 60s who were members of the Brown Berets, which was a kind of Texas version of the Black Panthers. These kids would come to Willie's house and say, Willie, you've been educated. You've gone to a fine university. Willie, help us to read Marx and Lenin. And Willie would say, look, you can read Marx and Lenin, but first I want you to read Plato and Aristotle. I want you to get some sense of the civilization to which you belong. It was an interesting idea. Willie wanted to make citizens first of these kids who were in the Brown Berets. You think about that, and you think about why people are poor, it's because they live inside this surround where the citizen's life is not possible. And we often say to, uh, to each other, well, if the poor did this, if the poor did that, the poor did not put themselves in this surround of force. Uh, people are born in that situation. It is very difficult. While working on, on this book, I went up to a place called the Bedford Hills Maximum Security Prison for Women. Um, I, I didn't go there to, to stay or be incarcerated. I went to visit. And there was a program there on family violence, uh, how, to, how to end it, uh, obviously. 
And I was sitting next to a woman, and uh, just casually I said to her, why do you think people are poor? And this woman, who had grown up in uh, uptown New York, in Harlem, said to me, it's because we don't have the moral life of downtown. I said, thinking she was going to tell me about religion, which I'd heard about a lot if you, if you visit people in prisons, I said, well, and what do you mean by that? And she said, we don't have concerts, museums, lectures, dance. I said, you mean the humanities? And this woman, who's, who's become a good friend, looked at me and she said, yeah, or all the humanities, as, as if I were an, an, an idiot. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and I thought, she knows something. Her, her name is Vinice Walker, and uh, unfortunately she's still in prison, although we, we've been trying hard to get her out. And on, on the way home from the prison, which is about 50 miles from New York City, where we live part of the time, I thought, what she said somehow agreed with what I learned when I, I went to school, the humanities. Was this the way to bring people into the political world? We know something about how the, the idea of politics developed, how the idea of citizenship developed. We know that in ancient Greece, we had the theater, a great theater. We had art, the arts, the, the plastic arts, there were the philosophers. And out of this, people began to think reflectively. If one went to see a play by Aeschylus or Sophocles, you reflected on what you saw. And we think that reflective thinking led people to look at the two poles of social life. That is, liberty on the one hand, and uh, on the other hand, the, the fierce organization that we have in, the, in some societies. So, what are the alternatives between order, on the one hand, and liberty, on the other hand? Well, if you follow the old middle way that uh, Aristotle tells us about, you look for some middle ground between liberty and order, and people said this is autonomos, which, you know, self-rule, self-government. And out of this sense of self-rule, self-government came what we learn, uh, what we know now as democracy. So that idea is, if you can teach people the humanities, will they become political persons in that Periclean sense of politics? Well, politics that begins at the home, goes on to the community, goes on to the, to the polis, to the city, to the state. Well, was it possible? I thought, you know, it's a, kind of a crazy idea. It worked for the Greeks. Would it work for very poor people here in the United States? Well, uh, Sylvia and I talked about it, and, uh, and Sylvia is a very kind person and did not think that I, didn't say that I was crazy. I don't know what she thought, but maybe you, you can say later. But we thought maybe we could start some kind of course where, in which we could teach the humanities at the university level. And, and by the university level, I mean the, the level that one would get at Harvard or Yale or Reed or Oxford, whatever. And could we do this for young people who had not earned a GED degree or some people who had been in prison, whatever, who were really poor? And we were interested in people who had been poor for more than one generation. That is, we, we didn't want people who had just fallen out, had some bad luck, but people for whom this surround of force had begun to create a kind of chain of poverty. So I went to ask an old friend named Jaime Inclan, who runs a place called the uh, Roberto Clemente Family Guidance Center, from which the course gets its name. And I told Jaime about it, and he's a, a psychotherapist, and he has one of those wonderful faces. And when I finished, he threw his arms open. He said, Earl, I'll give you the walls. So we had a classroom. Uh, and then I, I confess I play poker with a bunch of people in New York who are the writers and et cetera. And I recruited them to be the faculty the first year. And uh, there's a... <laughs> See, you, know, you have to pay for those games one way or another. Uh, and, and, and there's a joke now around that they were our million dollar faculty, and they were Grace Glick, who's a, an art critic for the New York Times, taught the art history section of the course. By the way, I should tell you that we borrowed the idea of the course from Petrarch, who you know, told us what the humanities are. And uh, as did Reed, I presume, borrowed from him. <laughs> 
And so Gracie taught the art history section. Charles Simmons, who's a, a first-rate novelist, won the Penn Faulkner Prize, was an editor at the Times Book Review for many years, taught the literature section of the course. A fellow who had studied with Noam Chomsky, uh, logic, not uh, politics, taught the logic section of the course. Uh, a fellow who was a good editor and historian taught part of the history section. And I taught the moral philosophy section. So five pieces, a course taught twice a week, two to two and a half hours uh, each time. And we began to recruit students. And, uh, and my first experience was horrible. Uh, I, I went to a place uh, run by uh, friends up in the South Bronx. And a woman who was African, from Africa, named Naba Kaba ran it. I knew her and uh, said, would you gather some of your clients together so that we can see if they'll come to the course? And she did. And then uh, Ruth Naba Kaba left me in the room with all of her clients and one social worker. And she went off to do her business. She thought it was a terrific idea. The one social worker was beside me, the only person in the room who was not either Latino or black. When I finished making my pitch about the course, uh, which you know was pretty much what I've told you, all the women uh, in the in the room these were mainly uh, single mothers, uh, who, who we still think are important people to come to the course. They all looked kind of interested, and then the woman, the social worker, raised her hand and said, "Well, there's something missing in your course. Are you going to teach uh, African history?" And I said, no, I'm going to teach American history, but American history is so involved with African-American history that I suppose, in a sense, we are, but it's American history. If I were in China, I would teach Chinese history. If I were in Africa, I would teach African history. If I were in Mexico, I would teach Mesoamerican history. And the woman uh, refused uh, to understand that uh, people were integrated in a multicultural society and, uh, and told all of her clients that this was a bad idea. And of the 35 people in the room, no one agreed to come to the course. Uh, and I thought, I'm done for. You know, this is the end. I have a good idea. I have a place to do it. I have all these crazy poker players and no students. Um, I, I went uh, down the street to a drug recovery program where I knew the people. And two women in the program said they would come to the course. So at, at that very day, uh, we had two students, one of whom was then almost 35 years old, and, that, and she set the upper limit for the course. Her name is uh, Carmen Quinones. Carmen had spent 10 years in prison, and, and she was tough. Uh, she used to take care of me when I left the place on the streets of the South Bronx. <laughs> that, that's not a joke. <laughs> it's a tough neighborhood. And we had two students, and then went uh, and began recruiting in other places. And I learned how to recruit people for the course. I learned to say, to a group of people who were young, who had had very difficult lives, who had probably not finished high school, to say in the very beginning, you've been cheated. Uh, and then the, the kids would all nod their heads. Yeah, they'd been cheated. They understood that. And, and we understood each other in that way. And so there was a possibility that some old white guy standing in front of these kids who had been uh, put down for m much of life might know something that they could talk about. And then I would tell them, I will make you rich. This is my promise. I will make you as rich as Rockefeller. In fact, richer, because some of Rockefeller's kids don't know as much about the humanities as you will know. And, and I explained to them what happens when you study the humanities rather than being trained. And I would explain to them that being trained means you do something that people have done before. You know? whether it's practicing medicine or being a dentist or operating a sewing machine or a computer. If you study the humanities, you will be beginning. You will always be at the beginning of thinking. And this thinking will make you a much richer person. You will enjoy things in life and you will think about things in life in a different way. And the kids came through. I must tell you the first year, and uh, Sylvia, who's much more honest than I am, will uh, attest to this, the kids came all year, and we had no promise of anything but the humanities. We could not, in the beginning, promise college credit. We couldn't even promise some kind of certificate. All we could give them was the humanities. That's all that they could get. And they came night after night. They came through the 
cold New York winter. And there, there were days when it was snowing and the sidewalks were covered with ice and we taught at night. We taught in the Lower East Side in Alphabet City. And these kids came to the class. The class was formal. They spoke uh, to each other as Mr. and Miss. The course looked like America. There were people who were alphabetically Asian, black, brown, and white in the course. The religions represented in this first year of the course were Catholic, Protestant, Muslim, Jewish, Buddhist. Uh, so we learned something else in the course, which is that, that race had nothing to do with it, that whatever race is, whatever that crazy social construct is, had no effect inside the classroom. The kids all got on. We learned, too, that these people who were poor, five of our people had been in prison, uh, three were homeless at the time, and, and they looked, they were the scariest looking bunch of kids you ever saw. Uh, because if you're poor, you better look scary. You live in a neighborhood where you have to defend yourself. You live in that surround of force. And these kids came to the class. It was the safest, most polite, most wonderful place in the city of New York. There was never a four-letter word uttered and I, I tell the joke all the time, the harshest moment in the course is when uh, one kid, Mr. Jones, stood up and pointed at a girl across the table and angrily shouted, define your terms. Huh? <laughs> and and this, this is the way it operates. So you ask the question, can you teach the humanities to the poor? Is it possible? Can you do for poor young people what's done for people who start out at Harvard or Yale or Reed or Bard, whatever. Toward the end of the year, Bard College uh, and, uh, and I had a conversation. Uh, in, in fact, the president of Bard and I had a conversation. He's a kind of crazy guy, but a good guy. And I said, would you be willing to give our kids a certificate? And he said, yes. And then I said, what about college credit? And he said, you have to talk to my academic senate and so on. And he said, but as far as our helping you, look, you'll get the credit before God and we'll get the publicity. So <laughs> it's a deal. <laughs> and, and they have been terrific about it. Uh, what happened then with the course? The course grew. We now teach in 11, 11 sites in the United States. We teach in Mexico, uh, where we teach in the Mayan language to Mayans, and we teach Mayan culture but the same level of high culture. We'll be starting uh, in a few weeks in Alaska, in western Alaska, uh, in a town called Chivak, where we'll teach in Chupik, which is the language spoken by the Yupit of that part of Alaska. It works. Uh, people change. Uh, it was never our intention to send people on to college. It was our intention to make citizens of people. And uh, somewhere along the way, we got interested in sending people to college. Of the first group, we started with 30, 17 uh, completed the course, 14 earned college credit from Bard. Um, every one of the kids went on to college. Uh, five went to Bard. We have kids out of the course going to Smith. We have uh, kids at NYU, at, uh, at various schools. They were poor, but they were wonderful. We have uh, three theories about the course. There's my theory, which is that it's the humanities that makes the course work. There's a theory that some psychologists have who've seen the course. They say it's that you pay attention to these kids and it's kind of the Westinghouse effect. And there's Sylvia's theory, which is that the kids are wonderful. And, and I think it's a combination of all three. M maybe the, the theory that the kids are wonderful is the best part of it. Can you do it here? Uh, I hope so. I hope that Portland can do it. This is a, a city of good ideas, good people. New things happen here. Christopher is, uh, is marvelous. We met with uh, people from Reed uh, last evening. Uh, it's, it's a course of, you know, as, as everyone knows, one of the great liberal arts institutions in, uh, in America. And we think that Reed College will participate. People have offered to help from Portland State and from the community college. Uh, uh, it's just been uh, marvelous here, the, the support that we feel from people. The Humanities Commission, uh, I see Mr. Brown uh, there. Uh, we, we all had lunch and talked about it. It's, uh, 
it's, it's possible. We need your help to do it. Uh, we need your help uh, in your contacts with the community. We need your support as part of the community. Uh, so I'm really here to ask for help. Uh, so there it is. It's a, it's a course for young people who are poor to make citizens of them. Uh, what is the payoff for the city of Portland? It may be that uh, another city councilman will be coming out of this group or someone else to run the, the port uh, here. Uh, it, is, it is an enriching thing for the community. It is an enriching thing for the people. It is that kind of justice that the Founding Fathers had in mind. So that's what I ask you to do. And, uh, and th these talks always work better when you ask the questions, because then you tell me things that I forgot to say, and, and, and you learn something. So thank you. The microphone is here for anyone that has a question. Yes. Uh, does Carol get the first? <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, Carol. <laughs> <laughs> Carol. <laughs> <laughs> Lloyd just told me he's a horrible person. <laughs> no, it, it's absolutely not true. Uh, it was an intriguing top talk and. Uh, your program, the Clemente uh, program, really sounds like it's getting some results. Uh, when I hear about something that's really good, I admit that one of my first reactions is usually, good, good, the sooner the better. Um, and so my question has to do with the fact that I know that right now, you know, you're busy uh, replicating this and, and working with, with other cities and, and other countries on uh, putting this into effect. Uh, my question is whether or not you think there might be a possibility that sometime in the future you would look at going younger in the age group. Uh, I know that the age group that you're, work that you're targeting right now is 17 to 35, and this is where it gets to my sooner the better, whether or not it might be possible to look at starting this with even younger uh, people, perhaps high school age. <laughs> Thank you. Um, thank you, I guess. That's a hard question. Uh, I, I had a question for you, which was, would you help us recruit? Because that, that was the real question that we had uh, before, uh, before all this. Uh, Carol obviously has, has uh, connections to the very people who we're looking to recruit in, into the course. It's, it, it is a hard question. When should the humanities be taught? Uh, it, you know, it's the grand American question. Why is it that the poor are not educated like the rich? Uh, we tell our kids, our prospective students, that, that the humanities have always been for the elite of this country. And then we say, you are the elite, so the humanities are for you. Th there are people who are experimenting now with teaching the humanities. Uh, in Seattle, when, when we were up there, a, a, woman, a woman, a very interesting woman, and her husband came by and they said they had heard about this idea and she was a junior high school teacher and they had worked on the myth of Gyges so they could teach the myth of Gyges in junior high school. Um, we have the great luck here uh, to have the director of the State Humanities Commission and and maybe there's some possibility that the Humanities Commission could help to do this at the, at the grade school, at the junior high school level, at least. De developing texts, et cetera, would be difficult, but not impossible. Uh, that might be a, w a way to do it. Uh, certainly, the federal government is not going to do it. The federal government's view is that we will train the poor so that we can keep the poor in fairly low-level jobs and they won't take our jobs away. M my view is that we should educate the poor and then we'll make the poor dangerous. That's, that's the usual title of this talk that I give, is how to make the poor dangerous. It, but dangerous in the same sense that we're dangerous as citizens. That's what, I mean, that's the idea that Martin Luther King had. He wanted to make people dangerous as citizens. He, he really knew what to do. I mean, of, of all the people who understood what 
had to happen. I think that uh, Dr. King probably knew it best, and as, as did Willie Velasquez. There are, there are people who understand how this has to happen. So it, it, the, the answer is, yeah, let's do it. I mean, <laughs> we, we're having a hard time just keeping up with the number of Clemente courses that, that grow, but, but it's a terrific idea. Are, are, are you going to do that? <laughs> Thank you. I'm sorry. Hi, Laura Nigro. I'm a New City Club member. Have, uh, regarding this first crop of students that completed your program, have you done any longitudinal studies to track their progress? And if so, just how poor are they now? Uh, we, we know all the kids. Uh, Sylvia and I got, uh, we did all the things wrong. The kids came to our house and we knew them all and, you know, Sylvia had the, all these heart-to-heart -heart talks with the girls in the course and so on. Uh, so we know them and we keep uh, track of them I mean, in, in a very personal way. It's, it's, it's a good question because Jaime and Klein used to say, let's see if the inoculation will take. That's the way he put your question. Um, one of the kids, uh, is having some trouble. One who went to Bard College, a very bright kid, um, he's, he's having some problems. Of all the rest, there was uh, one student uh, in the course who was, who was in trouble. Uh, she lost her job, but she lost her job for trying to start a union. So, you know, I'm, I'm not, you know, is that, is, that's not so bad. <laughs> so, did she become political? Yeah, she became political. Um, the kids are doing fine. One, one of the kids who, uh, who, who came from a really tough background, David was, uh, had been in prison, his parents told us he was a very tough kid, et cetera, and I'll tell a quick anecdote about him because it, it tells you what the course is about. After about three months in the course when we thought people ought to learn that uh, it's not force that they should use but negotiation, et cetera, I had a call on a Saturday morning from David, and we called each other Mr. and, uh, and Miss in those days in the course. And uh, the call came on Saturday morning. He said, Mr. Shores, uh, he always anglicized my name, for which I was not terribly grateful. He said, Mr. Shores, uh, I'd, I've had a problem. And I said, uh, yes, Mr. Howell, what is it? And I thought it's Saturday morning. He's been in jail. His parents say he uh, has a bad temper, and he's a big kid. He's about three times as big as I am. And it, he said, I've had a problem at work. And I said, uh, and, and what is that? He said, there's a woman at my office, and she told these lies about me to my supervisor and got me in a lot of trouble. And I said, oh, and, and David, what did you do? Mr. Mr. Howell, what did you do? He said, Mr. Shores, I was so mad, I wanted to pick her up and throw her against the wall. And I thought, it's just a one call from jail. You know, he's, uh, he did it. He did a terrible thing. And with great trepidation, I said, Mr. Howell, what did you do? He said, Mr. Shores, I asked myself, what would Socrates do? <laughs> so, so, so does it work? Dave, I must tell you, the last time I saw David Howell, uh, I called him. He said to me, he said, I'll see if I can make time for you. I'm very busy. Uh, and he's become incredibly political person. Uh, why was he busy? He was at his job and he was running a fair in his neighborhood to raise money for single mothers uh, for whom he had great compassion. So has, has, it, has it worked? Yeah, it really has. A lot of the kids are in school. There's nobody who I know of who's, uh, who's not both going to school and employed now. Uh, so it's, it's a pretty good record because the, the kids have come from tough circumstances. Judy Nichols, City Club member. As the Chief Development Officer for the Salvation Army here, I certainly agree with you that it's not one cause, it is the surround. My question is, what have you done to plug in the network of human service providers like the Salvation Army, who here in Portland, we're serving over 1,000 people a day, who many of whom meet your qualifications? Well, I, am I glad you're here. Uh, we, we had a little meeting uh, yesterday where we tried to get together with some of the service providers, and, uh, and in fact, uh, I, I'm 
Chris and I talked about where was the Salvation Army because usually when we go to a town, <laughs> the, one of the one of the people we talk to is from the Salvation Army because you do two things. Um, one, uh, you help us to find students. Uh, we certainly solicit students uh, who you know. And two, sometimes when our students get in trouble and and poor people have terrible troubles, it is hard to imagine how difficult it is to be poor in this, the richest country in the history of the world. It is hard to imagine. People have health problems, they lose their housing, they don't know how to deal with problems of illness, their children have, you, you know all those things better than I. So if our children have, our students, see how old I am, I think that 35 year olds are children. If, if the students have problems, <laughs> we need to be able to get them to social service agencies like the Salvation Army. So we need to have a two-way operation with you. And, and there's Christopher Zinn, and uh, you know each other, and, uh, and that's, that's the beginning of it. So you just did it. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay. Good afternoon, Mark Anderson, City Club member. I feel kind of like Mr. Jones. I'm going to ask you to define your terms. We've talked about rich and poor, but what I'm hearing is not an economic measure of poorness or richness, but a sociological one or a relative one. Can you expand on that? When you say they're 13% poverty level, that sounded like standard socioeconomic analysis, but the rest of your talk is not talking about that. Um, the, good point. Uh, Mr. Jones would be pleased uh, <laughs> to ask the question. Um, w what we've done in the course is we've looked at the poverty level, uh, and, and we generally say that we take people in the course who fall somewhere below 150% of the federal poverty level. I've, I've written this book, New American Blues, where, where I I'll have a longer and I hope a better answer than I'll give here. The, the woman who defined the poverty level, uh, as you know, has since uh, renounced that whole notion. Uh, she says that it was wrong, that it was the wrong measure, etc. How do we define poverty? Um, th those people who don't have any money in this country, who are forced by systems of redlining, by racism, by economic uh, restraints to live in poor surroundings generally uh, are the people who are treated least fairly. They're not given the chance to study the humanities. They're not given the chance to develop. It, it is a loss to them and it's probably an enormous loss to the society as, as we've begun to learn where you know some of these kids are terrific and we're losing them. Um, do, do we define them economically? It's an argument we always have, and we say to each other, how do you know that the people who are applying for the course are poor? Well, um, there are some middle class people who have tried to sneak into the course, and, uh, and that's always, it's, you know, it's, it's astonishing. You know, a guy will come to the course, say, my father is a mailman, he makes $65,000 a year, I need to come to this course. And I say, thank you very much. Uh, I will tell you what colleges you can apply to. A kid came to the course. He said, uh, I'm, I, my family lives in Nigeria. I'm uh, very poor here. I said, what does your family do in Nigeria? He said, well, they're in the, they have a cleaning and, and dying place. I said, how many people work there? He said, 750, you know. <laughs> so, so kids have, have tried to come into the course. You know, the mailman son, the kid, you know, the rich kid from Nigeria because it's a good course, it's well taught, etc. cetera. The, the belief that we have about the poor is that if you're really poor, you know it, and you know if you've been cheated. And in, in a sense, I think that the people who come to the course, the students we recruit, are better at defining poverty than I am. I, I learned by going around the country talking to poor people, poor people are smart, they understand what it's like to be poor, you know, a lot better than I do. So these, these young people will tell you, they'll tell you what it's like. You'll know when you talk to them. Like somebody once said, how do you decide whether to take them into the course? Well, one, we say you have to be able to read. Uh, and, and I think that's a, a given. If you, if you can read the daily paper, you can read Plato. Um, but then 
you know, how do you decide? Well, you have to let your heart decide. I, I think that the issue about who's rich and who's poor in this country is on a subjective level as clear as it can be. Uh, and there are a lot of, a, a lot of phony definitions. And, uh, and, and I think that the poor are those who've been cheated, those who've not been permitted uh, to have what the rich folks have. Not, not a very elegant definition, but, but it's, it's, it's real. It's a real world. Hello, Bill Parrish, City Club member. Uh, the Economist, a big UK paper or magazine on August 7th, had a cover story titled Share and Share Unalike. And then a couple of weeks ago, a local radio station all did a sh also did a show, KUIK, on a s the topic. And they interviewed me, basically. And David Wu and many others called in later and found it very interesting. But my question is this. One fact from the Economist uh, piece that is very interesting is that um, the Microsoft Corporation says it earned four and a half billion dollars in 1998, and they indicate they lost 18. Now, to most people, that sounds esoteric and uninteresting, but the net effect of it is the government for 1998 provided Microsoft payment of four billion dollars in terms of a subsidy, and it's going to be much higher in 1999. Now, no one knows this is occurring, so my question would be. Do you think it would be more appropriate for government policy to be providing a subsidy to higher education in the amount of $4 billion than to the Microsoft Corporation, which now has a market value of half a trillion dollars? Um, yes. I, mean, <laughs> I, I, I might add, uh, it sounds hard to believe. Most people don't believe this, but I have a website, BillParish.com, 1R, P-A-R-I-S-H, and it's all there in the link to The Economist. But it's, a tr it's true. Really, the, uh, mm -hmm. the Microsoft story. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I don't belong to the Gates fan club, so I, uh, I, 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 this is off the subject. I once called Microsoft and, and, and I bought some stuff from them and it doesn't work. And I called them up and I said, yeah, this doesn't work. And they said, well, if it's a problem we knew about, we'll fix it. But if it's one we don't know about, we won't fix it. I said, well, why did you sell it to me if you knew it didn't work? And they said, well, you know, we, uh, we'll fix it if it's something we knew about. I said, I'm going to write something about this. Uh, I would like to know your name, et cetera. And the guy said, you can't write about us unless Microsoft's lawyers give you permission. I said, I, said, I have permission from the Constitution. <laughs> anyway, he's... Ah, OK, thank you. Thank you. I'm Joe Nadal, a member. I'd be interested to know what you do include or do not include in when you speak of humanities, often when I hear the term used, I think, well, they're going to talk about something, but they're not going to talk about, say, mathematics or the sciences. Do you include mathematics and the sciences in your teaching of the humanities? And if not, uh, why not? <laughs> um, well, sir, that's, that's, that's a good and serious question. Uh, I mean, we've spent a long time talking about it. In the, in, if we were defining the liberal arts, I would say that in the liberal arts, it would be absolutely vital to include the sciences, the hard sciences, social sciences, mathematics. You can tell I'm a Hutchins baby uh, doing the old curriculum. And I think that that is absolutely required in a liberal arts curriculum. But it seems to me that within a liberal arts curriculum, there should be a humanities component. And it's the humanities component that we're talking about in an entire liberal arts curriculum. How close do I think we should get to mathematics and the sciences? I think we should get at least close enough to teach logic. I think that uh, Petrarch thought that was a good idea, and I think he's right. Um, how do the humanities relate to the sciences? Is the, the question is interesting. Sometimes w when I go to towns, I make a little talk about the, the value of a practical education. And my argument is that the humanities uh, really provide the most practical education. Why do I say that? If, if we think of a young fellow in Poland who was a humanities student, who really was not a science student in any way. Um, this young Polish fellow looked up at the sky after his study of the humanities, and Copernicus turned the world on its ear. So the, the thought is that the humanities uh, 
do something in the way of opening the mind. There's this sense of always beginning in the humanities that I think enables people to think more freely in the sciences and, and in the practical world as well as in the humanities. So is it, is it an entire education? Absolutely not. Should everyone get a liberal arts education? You bet. I think you know, you're exactly right. We, we can only teach in the course of one year in 55 sessions a, a fairly rudimentary, although very rigorous, humanities course. Our dream is that the kids will go on and, and get a full liberal education. I was going to say, there's nobody behind me. I might just mention, but there is somebody there behind me. There is a man behind you. <laughs> that the great books of the Western world did include Euclid. Well, we, te we, te we teach logic in the course, so... Uh, you come close, uh, thank you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's a straight line from uh, logic <laughs> to Euclid. Well, I don't have one of those. John Leeper, City Club member. Hi. I uh, appreciate your presentation, sir. My question for you is, in that we have, I think, a sizable listening audience, I think it would do well if, in fact, it could be articulated to both the attendees here as well as for the radio audience, any interest that anyone might have as to who could be contacted locally about this and what type qualifications is it that you're seeking as you look for support. Bless you. And he's not a plant. He, he did that. <laughs> Thank you. Um, who could they contact locally? Um, Christopher? Uh, the person to contact is Christopher Zinn, who is the director of the State Humanities Commission, Council, who is the, uh, it's largely because of Christopher and Peter Steinberger at Reed that, that I'm here, that we're here. Um, they are, I don't want to embarrass him, but they're absolutely wonderful. And, and if you, whoever's listening, whoever's watching, whatever, if you are either in a social service organization, uh, we, we or, or in any other kind of organization that is interested in, in changing the lives, in helping people who are poor, in helping bring more people to this society, to increasing the democracy, to strengthening the country we live in, the thing to do is, is call Christopher. We're looking hard for support. We think there's several things we need to do. We need to recruit. So as, as I was saying to the uh, woman from the Salvation Army, we need your help to recruit. We need help from people who run drug programs because we think that people who are recovering addicts make good students. Uh, we think that people who have been in prison uh, for a while sometimes come out and make great students. We've, we've had those experiences. We're interested in those people whom the society has thrown away. Um, we think that's a mistake on the part of the society. Uh, so we're, we're trying hard. We, we need your help. Please call. Christopher's in. Do you want to, does everybody know the Humanities Council's phone number? Do we need to tell them that? It's in the phone book. It's on your... It, you just, oh my goodness. Okay, I'm sorry. It's 1-800-735-0543. And do they ask for Christopher or do they ask for you? Okay. Should we say it again? We'll pretend that we're selling uh, records on uh, the TV <laughs> late at night. <laughs> I'm sorry, it was an 800 number, 1-800-735-0543. And uh, I mean, if, if you're very lucky, you'll get Mr. Mr. Zinn's entire album on CD. <laughs> Please. Betsy Warner, I'm a member Hi. of the City Club. And I think I'm beginning to understand what you're saying about the link between study of the humanities and citizenship. But I think one reason it's hard for me and many of us to understand is because I grew up surround, my surround was the humanities everywhere, my family, school, college, the concert hall, it was all around. So it's just natural, it's like the air I breathe. So when you're breathing the air, sometimes you need somebody else to describe to you exactly what that connection is. What is that air? How do you define it? And, 
can you tell me how the humanities and citizenship really do link together? Thanks. Thank you. The, uh, the person who made the link for me was Vine East Nisi Walker up in this prison. Um, and, and you know, I'd, you know, I'd had rumblings, inklings, whatever, uh, from Willie Velasquez. And certainly if you think about what Dr. King was doing, you, you get those senses. How does it work? I'll, I'll do it uh, as best I can. We know what happened in ancient Greece. That is the model. That's why in the Clemente course, we're very interested in teaching the classics. And we do. We, we ask our students to read Plato, Aristotle, Hume, Kant. We ask them to read a uh, play, either Aeschylus or Sophocles, Shakespeare. So we, we want to do that because we, we have a sense of how it happened. How do we think it happens? If people learn to think reflectively, and the humanities demand that kind of reflection in a way that no other discipline does, uh, for all that, that we think that the most elegant invention in the world is by the great mathematicians, even more than by the great poets, it's the humanities that ask us to begin, to always begin, to think about the world anew, to reflect on what happens, on what we know in literature. And we learn the, the habit, to borrow from Aristotle, of this virtue of examining, of examining, of thinking, of reflecting. If we reflect on life and we look at the world around us, the humanities uh, tell us to look at the world. The theater comes of the world. If you study the ancient Greek theater, you will find the Greek world in the theater. And, and it tells us to do this, to think. And once we reflect, we see that in, in the society there are these polar opposites. We can either have order or we can have liberty. We can have that kind of crazy chaos that, that certainly is, is possible. And we begin to see that we can govern ourselves. And, the, and for, for reasons that, uh, that I really can't tell you what goes on in, in our brains, but we know the, the response. We, we see the possibility of legitimate power. And sometimes in the humanities, you know, we teach Antigone almost always in the course because we see that, that battle between family and law, and, and our kids know that battle as, as many middle class people can't imagine. So we see in the humanities how the world works, and we reflect on the world and the way it works, because the humanities have always reflected on the world. And, and I sincerely believe that, that out of this reflection, comes a willingness to negotiate, to understand the world as not made of force, but a world that can be made of negotiation where legitimate power is possible. I think that happens when people study the humanities. I think they, they learn from the poets what legitimate life is like, and just from the connection. If you think of poor people as isolated, and anybody who's ever dealt with poor people knows the terrible isolation, and then you think of the humanities, of the connection between the painter and the viewer. In the humanities, there is the beginning of connection, the beginning of political life, of social life. I think it works it just wonderfully well. And any society without the humanities is a, is a society in great trouble. And it may be one of the great troubles in this society, that there are too few people. Uh, We've got time for one brief question and brief answer. Okay. I kind of want to go back to what Carol brought up on her first question about teaching this to younger children. In Oregon, um, we have state uh, mandated standards, so we're doing a lot of training in our schools, and we have severe funding problems, so the arts and humanities have been cut pretty severely. And we also have significant dropout problems. And I'm wondering if you know of any statistics or if you've gotten feedback from your students, if they had had this sort of work at earlier grades, do you think we would be uh, adverse, you know, reversing this effect of dropouts and failures in the school system? I, I hope so. Uh, we, we can talk afterward. I'll, I'll be here for a little while. Uh, I, I know we, we need to wrap this up. I'm, I'm just a writer. I'm not an educator. I just write books and, and novels and, and things like that and, and some political philosophy. So I, I, I'm not competent to answer